Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladocast episode 46. I'm Steve Tudor. I'm John Cage. And I'm Andy Lewis. With a new sexy microphone. Well, let's hope so. Hopefully, yeah. Basically, I've got bored of these two <laughs> whinging. I've gone all out and I've gone on and bought a turbo thing, which looks even more like a sex aid mm. than Steve's does. Rhino sex aid. That's the one, yeah. Gone for the hippo sex aid. <laughs> Is it on a long, swingy even arm, shaped. though? <laughs> it isn't on an arm. It's not on an isolation mount, so there's occasional thump. I do apologise in advance. It is sat on my footrest. It might get a thump. It means you can finally play the polyhedron cladder drinking game. Every time you hear a thump, it's Andy putting his pint glass down. So if you hear the thump, it means Andy's drank, so you have to drink as well. Like that. There we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Drink. <laughs> Cheers. Where are we, boys? Right. There we go. That's the technical job bit done. This is going to get messy quickly, isn't it? <laughs> Wait, you two are drinking, yes. It's written in the scriptures, recorded for the ages, and passed down from generation to generation that I was right. You're going to have to because... be more specific. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm right a lot, you mean? No, <laughs> specifically what one thing were you right about once, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, while we were away, well, basically you two were in Scotland doing things. Together, I might add. We <laughs> shall discuss later. <laughs> it was Gen Con, and we said in the last episode that like a professional podcast would talk about what was coming out in Gen Con, so I think oh, now we can talk yeah. about what did happen. Um, we've got that kind of filter of a couple of weeks now, where all the interesting stuff has bubbled to the top and everything else that was boring, we've already forgotten about. So at Gen Con, Fantasy Flight Games announced Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. Bum, bum, bum. I'm, I'm pretty sure I can see Steve's head getting slowly bigger on camera now. <laughs> <laughs> engage smug mode. Smug You're mode engaged. engaged. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you've earned that smug mode, Steve. Well predicted. <laughs> bum. <laughs> so what's different in it? Well, this is what's really quite interesting, actually, because I was expecting a third edition to just be, uh, you know, updated and revised version, you know, similar to the existing Arkham Horror, because... Prettier pictures, nicer stuff, yeah, yeah. Streamlined. Smooth off the rough edges of, you know, Arkham Horror, which second edition, which has got some clunky things in, and off you go. They're called expansions, Steve. <laughs> Well, no, there's some clunky things in that game as it is, and the expansions just just add to the clunk, basically. <laughs> just exacerbate. <laughs> yeah. But what's interesting is this feels and looks like it's almost like a different game. It's it really got the does, ba- yeah. same basics of Arkham Horror, but they've added so much extra, made so many changes. I think this could sit on the shelf next to your second edition. You know, it doesn't feel like I'm going to have to throw second edition out just because this is coming along. So what is different is it's going to be much more scenario-based. The thing about Arkham Horror is the original, the original first two versions, was it was always the same Arkham. Mm-hmm. And what was happening was events were changing, so the randomness of, of the game was what was changing it. Whereas this is going to be more scenario-based, so you're going to make an individual Arkham or an individual section of Arkham from its modular board, which if you've seen any kind of modular dungeon crawler, it looks a little bit like that, but with these large kind of town areas and streets connecting them so like so like hexes aren't they with little uh, yeah little it's, passageways. it's almost like um a little bit like some star trek ascendancy but a bit chunkier yeah that's a good way to describe it yeah and my understanding is as well so all the cards which is basically you know you can't have an argument horror without drawing cards are also going to be based on that scenario so you're going to have different decks for each scenario which means that every time you play it could be different you don't want to know what i think it's basically happened here What's that? They've basically decided to hybridise Mansion of Madness and Fallout. Do you know what? I think you're right. I usually am. What I've read in the description. (laughs) No, that's not my experience at all. (laughs) You must be talking about someone else. Steve, he's the right one, isn't he? No, he's been right (laughs) once. I'm right frequently. And I am wrong, John. (laughs) For several reasons. (laughs) Every way. But I think just just the way you've described it there, Steve, and I entirely agree with you, the modular scenario-based system 
is kind of lends itself to Mansions of Madness because you're building a map as you go along. And obviously, I don't think this is app driven, is it? It's just the card based thing. But you are, in essence, dealing with a different map every time. Um, whereas in Fallout, it does have the scenario based encounter cards. And they're all obviously you go through those, you go them and you go you turn turn to four hundred card for instance before, there's a bit of story. I think they've taken those two aspects and kind of squished them together. Which to be fair, would work quite well. I think you're right, actually. There does seem to be a few ideas they've taken from Fallout. Mm. I don't think it's gonna have that huge deck, that huge like you know, hundred and fifty card deck that you have to find card fifty three or whatever in. <laughs> No, but I think what they're doing is taking a ch- taking a chunk of that kind of like so you will take a deck of, you'll set up a deck for that scenario and then off you go. Now it does mean it's FFG, so no doubt there will be two hundred expansions planned. So if you need a special deck for each scenario, does that mean and presumably some of the cards will be shared between them? Probably, I'd assume so, but we don't know at this point. It might be like Doom. It does beg the question: like, are you then going to have to spend? like 15 minutes at the start of every game just shuffling all the right ones into the right piles to I think so so it'd be like a bit like Doom or you know Imperial Assault where you've got to basically set up decks for each each different individual player because if you remember in Doom everyone had to like chooses their own loadout and that loadout you get 10 cards based on the two weapons you pick and four like base cards so mm. uh, that's the simpler version but I suspect this is probably going to be very similar because Doom takes bloody ages to set up. Maybe they'll come up with some clever way of just being able to sort them out quickly. Looking at the images on some of the websites, it gives you like the great old one. So it gives you Azathoth, which is always like your, your first bad guy, great old one you play. And it does suggest like you will take these monsters and add them to the monster deck. You'll add these tokens and add them to the uh, Mythos Cup, which is something from the Arkham Horror LCG. Mm-hmm. So yes, I have a funny feeling this is either going to take a while to set up or it's going to be a little bit like Actions of Madness is where you're going to end up with a whole load of components which are used for that scenario only. Mm, yeah. Which is a concern because that means you're going to be buying expansions from now till the end of all time, much like Mansions of Madness. I failed to, fail to see a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that is one slight irritation with Manchester Mothers. When you've got lots of expansions, you have to spend quite a long time rifling through. Is that the right hallway? Is that the right hallway? Is that the right yeah. hallway? <laughs> you could see it having a bit more downtime for it. What I find disappointing is it doesn't reuse enough of those map tiles. Mm-hmm. God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. Now I've got all of them. There's like loads of them. John's just said, basically mentioned one hallway. It's exactly the same as another as exactly the same another hallway for all intents and purposes. Okay, the artwork's slightly different, but you know, ultimately, who gives a shit? And there are a couple of the later scenarios in which the most recent expansion that have um, like a carn- carnival float or something like that. And I haven't actually played the scenario, so I don't know how it's used. But you can just see that's good for literally one scenario. Why have you done that? Why not just have a street and pretend <laughs> something's there? Oh, that's right, so we can milk another 60 quid out of us, you crafty bastards. <laughs> and obviously it's worked. But <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I am rather excited for that because we all know I am a ridiculous dyed-in-the-wall Arkham Horror fan and I think I own every single Arkham Horror game that FFG have released since Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. So um, it's inevitable. You've got it's me what? hooked as well, you twat. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fair to say all three of us are pretty addicted to those games. It's true. Yeah, very, true. very fair. Well, it does look good, I must admit. I'm very tempted because, you know, I haven't got the second edition. You two both have, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, see, mm-hmm. I don't, so I'm tempted. It might be worth me buying the third edition and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just throwing that out there. Economically, that would make a lot of sense, which isn't like it. For you two, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Given that I'm the one supposed to be moving house in a few months' time, maybe not, but we'll see. But it is you, Andy, so I let's know, face I it, know, you're going to buy it. You, well, of course I am, yeah, yeah. There you go, FG. Here, FG, one customer already. <laughs> I'll keep the, the, the company afloat for a while. Well, speaking of keeping them afloat and random purchases... The other game they announced, which is their other big game, was something rather quite new. This is something called Keyforge, and I think the full title is Keyforge Call of the Archons. That's the one. 
which is I don't want to call it a collectible card game because it's not quite a collectible card game. Isn't it? But it is and it isn't. So it's from the designer of the original designer of the collectible card game genre. So it's from Richard Garfield, mm-hmm. who designed Magic the Gathering and Netrunner. But this is weird because this is a card game in which you will have and buy a unique deck. So when you buy the deck off the shelf, it will be completely unique, apparently. There'll be no other deck like it out there. That's what they say. It promises to make deck building and boosters a thing of the past, except you do buy the pre-built decks. Yes. They say that there are 104, and then put 24 zeros to the right of that, combinations of decks that, that can exist, and they say that each one is unique. Given that many zeros, that's probably a fairly accurate claim. Which, on the face of it, sounds kind of cool, because think of all the different permutations that could be that could be possible. But I can't help feeling that it's a bit like all the downtime in Star Trek, where they went to several hundred worlds and it was just another rock, <laughs> and another rock, and another rock, and oh no, no, it's another rock. <laughs> All the stuff you don't see in Star Trek. Yeah, exactly. Or or No Man's Sky, if you ever play that computer game. Oh, yes. Where there's the infinite universe sort of thing, and you're gradually, infinitely generated universe, and you gradually go through and you visit lots of planets. And a lot of them look good, but it's just like, yeah, it's another rock. It's another rock. It's another rock. (laughs) That game for, like, the first three hours is amazing. It's like, oh, my God, this planet's purple, and it's cold, and there's a thing that looks like an elephant that walks backwards and find bugs and fly robots, and it gets to, like, the third or fourth planet. You're like, okay, this one's blue, but it's still a backwards walking elephant. Ten planets in, it's like, oh, God, can I just find the bloody flip tromium or whatever I need to get onto the next (laughs) planet? And go, why am I carrying on? Why am I doing this? Because I haven't finished it. Ah! Now I'm on Sky, also known as No Game. Apparently they've updated it and improved it. Anyway, we're getting off topic. That would be my worry, though, is that because although there's an infinite number of decks, there's probably a reasonably large proportion of them that aren't particularly good. And then it just becomes a CCG, I think, because you're just spooling through until you find the good combinations of decks. And that Mm. leads to another question that occurred to me. (laughs) If all of these things are just combinations of cards, then presumably you could just, once loads of people start using this system, you'll start to see which decks are good. Like, people will post online, like, aha, found a brilliant combination. Other people will be like, well, I've got those cards. Great, I've got that deck. Okay, fine, I'll just keep watching until i find the good decks and just grab those or i'll look at which ones work well and formulate my own at which point it becomes a deck builder so where's the novelty <laughs> the interesting thing is they're itchy, they're going to be unique and they're going to have like codes on them and things like that so they'll have uh, different card backs i don't know how many different card back styles there's going to be but it's also going to have a number printed on it some unique identifier so if you do mix cards from two different decks mm-hmm. you'll be able to see that they are from different decks. But presumably they're not making 104 plus 24 zeros different cards. No, there'll be a set number of cards and it's just a random combination, isn't it? Yeah. Of what cards you get. The the preliminary stories I've heard of people who've played it is that actually the gameplay of this game is really good. Mm. I've heard a lot of people say it's a really good two-player card game. I could believe that. And I've heard as well that people are quite optimistic about like the tournament side of it because in Magic, have you heard of the um, like deck building tournaments mm-hmm. where you go into a game of t- Magic and you're basically given like or you pay for effectively like twenty booster packs, and before the tournament starts, you have to try and make a deck out of those booster packs. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine that if you could do a sealed tournament, where you start the tournament and you're just given right, this is your deck for the tournament, and you've got right flick for it, right, what strategies can I see, what can I expect to play with this. And I like that idea. Yeah, I really like that idea. Because I quite like it when you get, like, I don't want to say it because we're going to come on to this later, but there are certain games out there that involve running around in circles where you sometimes get given really crap characters or really good characters. And sometimes the really good characters do make the game easier. But other times it's actually quite a lot of fun to take the worst, most crappiest minstrel, I mean character, uh, it's like the sound, it's like the sound and, of a and, cat <laughs> running out of a bag <laughs> and trying to uh, to win the game with it regardless it's just more of a challenge so I kind of like the mm. idea I, I don't like the fact that they seem to have marketed it as like this massive great new thing doesn't sound that different to me but I do like the idea of it 
<laughs> mm. that makes sense i think i will be having a go at this like, i have a funny feeling i'm going to buy that starter set even if it's just the starter set which i think a lot of people are going to do it's going to sell shit loads of copies for the first six months and then we'll see what it's like after that but i, I can see me giving this go a go and seeing how we get with it you do that steve if you dear listener haven't seen this uh the gist of it is that um you're sort of playing little demigods So these archons, these demigods, um, clash in the crucible, and you're basically on a planet trying to collect as much amber as quickly as you can. So you can choose, but you sort of get to choose between either trying to gather that amber, or ember, or a-ember, as they put it on their website. It's something like that. It's pronounced amber. It's pronounced amber in the uh, (laughs) in the trailer, but it's a-e ember. So yeah. it's a diphthong, Mr. Cage. Because inside amber, yes, <laughs> a diphthong, the combined vowel. Anyway, mm. uh, they pronounce it amber in the trailer, so it's amber. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you, you get to choose between either for each turn, you get to choose one of um, the three houses that you've picked up. There are seven of them apparently. Uh, so for the one turn or for each turn you only get to play with one of them so you've got to select what you want to do this turn and maybe pick which strengths and weaknesses you're going to use between the three decks that you've got okay. and then you get to go after either go after the amber or fight the opponents try and weaken their force so i kind of like this the idea of that like the background kind of kind of sounds cool i just well i don't like the fact that it's a ccg to be honest because <laughs> i don't agree with them it's not a CCG. But this is, is an interesting thing. But it is an... It is. It's not often John and I agree on games, but I do agree with him. It's a CCG, just in a different coat. <laughs> it probably depends how strict you do it. So if you just go by the codes on the back, so this yeah. is the deck, and you can you can only use a pre-existing randomly rolled deck, then it's a bit different. Yeah, which is the spirit of the game, which is the intention. Yeah. What happens if you come across a dick who decides to combine two decks to make a stronger deck? Well, they're not really not playing in the spirit of it, really, is it? You know? But equally, you could find, like, with you amongst your mates, someone just randomly happens to get a really strong one, and they always play with it. And, you always, yeah. and you've just got, like, you bought five now, and you're feeling a bit grumpy because they're all crap. <laughs> <laughs> or you can't find some... It, they say the strength of the game isn't in the cards that you get. It's the combinations of cards. So it's how you use them together that makes the strengths. But I can't help feeling there are going to be combinations where those strengths play off each other well and others where they don't. Yeah. And if you've bought like five decks in a row and you've still got awful ones and your buddies have all got like, huh, I only bought one, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I can see that being irritating. And for that reason, I'm out. What I find fascinating about this is this is obviously an advancement in the manufacturing technology. It sounds like Fantasy Flight Games have advanced their digital printing to a point where they can actually print out. Because I said these numbers and back card backs are all unique. Yeah. So they've managed to get to a way they can print a deck of cards that is just one print, which seems to suggest that their their methods of digital printing have like beyond what they were like five or ten years ago. At least some aspect of it is. They've used to do this print on demand system. Mm Mm-hmm. So there's a few smaller expansions for some of their games, which they call Print on Demand, and they, the two little expansions for Game of Thrones board game, which, by the way, they also announced the massive expansion for Game of Thrones board game. Did you see that? Dragons. I... It's going to add dragons to the game. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Hold the phone. I, I, knew, I knew there was expansion. I haven't seen any of it, any detail of it yet, but um, mother freaking and dragons. A second board. Jesus Christ. I don't think... Oh, is that the Across the Sea? Yeah. I don't think it's going right, to fit okay. on my table. Yeah. <laughs> because it goes, it, 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 geographically, it has to sit next to Westeros. Well, I usually play Game of Thrones like in landscape format, as it were. <laughs> but I, have to, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. Hopefully, there's another way you can do this. You have to, you have to upgrade your table, or, Steve. Or uh, add like a second tier to it glass shelf <laughs> above it. Nice. <laughs> I think it so could yes, work. That's another, thing I'm ex- that's another thing I'm excited for. But the um, Printing. As I said, Game of Thrones used to use this for the, the two expansions I've got for Game of Thrones that they'd already in- uh, released where this print on demand. You had to order them direct. So they've already got this system where they can print these off reasonably cheaply. So I think it's an advancement of that. 
It could just be if there's like a finite number, presumably there's a finite number of cards and it's the combinations of those cards that make the different decks. So if all they need to yeah. change is like the barcode or the, the code on the back that says that's probably not too difficult. So you said that and then they announced this other game. Huh. Ooh. Now this looks interesting. This is again Fantasy Flight Games, but this is a board game. And it sounds like it the general gist of the game is you're going to have a number of adventurers who are lost who are trying to find their way home. And the concept is that if us three buy this game, then each of us will have a different game in the box. Yeah. That's interesting. It's got the same yes. basic rules. Yeah. And same, like there'll be some common components, like there's meeples to represent the characters. And it looks like you've got some, you know, patented fan- Fantasy Flight Games spinny discs. Mm-hmm. But after that, it says that all the components and combination of components is unique. So we would end mm. up with three separate games. Those are two very different things. It looks really cool. The, the combinations of components or the actual components are unique? I Well, I think you're going to see some replication. Mm. Because basically it says you're, you're lost in the wilderness at the moment. They've announced like a, a forest, a desert, and the act. There's another one, isn't there, on the title? Oh, uh, is it mountains, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So I can see that, like, one of us, you might, two of you might get a mountains box set. But the story is that what's in there that makes up the full components of the game is different. It's To me, this looks, it looks really cool. I like the idea of it. I, I suspect there's going to be a lot of crossover between boxes, though, because unlike the cards, card card stock and maps and stuff and hexes and things are going to be a lot less easily replicated. What's the word? Yeah, it's going to be more difficult to print on card stock than it is on a card. Exactly, yeah. More expensive. There'll be a little bit less variance. I suspect when they say every game will be different, the changes from one box to another will be minimal at best, unlike the cards and the stuff for um, Call of the Archons. But this does look good, quite cool. Do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a game called Granny's Garden. Do you remember that on the BBC Micro in the 1980s? Oh, uh, not maybe. at all. <gasps> Granny's Garden was a wonderful. It's basically an exploration Sounds a bit game. Wrong. And uh, <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yes, these days it could be. It could mean something else entirely. There's a lot of spiders in that garden. Would you like to play in Granny's Garden, no. children? <laughs> not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, but yes, there was another game that I distinctly remember we played on this. We had this primary school. This BBC Micro it was in. It was in this enormous wooden cupboard thing you could wheel yeah. around, and it was shifting round the nice old shipping container. <laughs> yeah. It was that bloody large, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, digital watches these days have got probably got more computing power than that. I think, but. Um, by God, it was fun. But one of the games we had on it was this sort of desert island exploration game. And that's the yes, bit that I reminds that. me of this. Yeah. That was good. I can't remember yeah. what the hell it was called. It was really cool. Um, you wander around, you find treasure or a spade or whatever the hell it was. But we never, ever got off the island. We always died. But uh, this reminds me of that. You know, you're wandering around, just exploring uh, on the map. Um, it's not a new concept, but for some reason, this is what it reminds me of. And that was great fun. So I like the idea of this. I like the idea of venturing into... Um... Looking at the artwork, it looks like a much happier uh, version of Zork. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Zork? <laughs> yes. The text space. I never played the original Zork. It was epic. It, but every single time I played it, at some point, I would eventually wander into a dark patch. For some reason, I my lantern would run out, or for whatever reason, it would go dark, and you'd hear a noise. Your sword would glow blue, which suggests there's something nasty nearby, and then suddenly, you'd get eaten by Gru. <laughs> Game over. Start again. <laughs> Mother... <laughs> <laughs> it is dark. You have been eaten by a Gru. So I never played the original one, but I played the um, the kind of remake, which was with the full motion video. Um, Ooh, oh god, what was it called? Fancy. Mist. No, no, it, no. It came after Mist, so it was like it was Zork, but it came after R- Mist. Riven, Riven. No, no, no. I said it. What? No. Um, hang on. 
and looked at the thing on the internet. Go, Zork Nemesis, that was it. I remember Return to Zork, actually. To Zork Nemesis... Was that like was that like Star Trek Nemesis, but thankfully a lot better? Um, well, mm, see, it was a bit weird at the time when full motion video was a thing, you know. So rather than having you know mm. computer graphics, you actually filmed people in like cheap costumes on a green screen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's it. Yes, Command and Conquer. Yeah, it was that kind of um, era. Privateer. Gloria. Yeah, that yeah. was amazing. Privateer. And they did. did Alien Breed Tyrus on. Did you ever see the full intro to that on the no. CD32? No. My um, God. Um, what? That was bad. <laughs> oh, and this, oh, for the immediate third CD32, do you not remember that? I remember it, but I never knew anyone that owned it. Oh, no, 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 no. You could look at the video on, on YouTube, but I used to know somebody who had a thesis CD32, and you could get, uh, you could run it run it on the A1200 if you had the CD version of it, you know, and they had a CD ROM, which obviously back in those <laughs> days cost about six hundred pounds because it was alien technology forged from magical obsidian from the future, the proud dwarves <laughs> of Middle Earth. Yeah, 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 from the future, exactly. It was just ridiculous, but um, it was all acted by the developers of the game, and that is oh, why dear. software engineers should <laughs> oh, not ever God. act. <laughs> and and. Of course, all the computer graphics were does on things like Amigas and uh, whatever the hell they had back then. So uh, it was all it was all shitty graphics, crappy <laughs> acting, and a really ropey script. It was amazing. <laughs> Although to be fair, Alien Breed Tower Assault was one of the best games ever made. You say so. Do you want to know something really bad that's going to make you feel old? Go on. Go on. Well, Zork Nemesis, I see as the modern remake of Zork, okay? <laughs> modern. <laughs> yeah. Zork came out in about 1978, 79. Mm-hmm. So it's almost, it's about the same age as me. Zork Nemesis came out in 1996. Wow. Jesus. Which means the time between now and Zork Nemesis coming out is longer than the time between Zork and Zork Nemesis coming out. Good grief. Oh, dear. I feel very, very old all of a sudden. Yeah, you should. God damn it. Right, let's uh, let's forget about that, move on to something else. Let's move swiftly yes. on to something slightly happier. What are some new modern computer gamey kind of things? Ah, Gloomhaven Digital. <laughs> I see what you did there, Mr Cage. Oh, smoothly done, Mr Cage. <laughs> as smooth as a syrup enema. So Gloomhaven I've played one session of, and I would... <laughs> Really like to play some more of it. Face. <laughs> Sorry. I thought we could just brush over that. We could just cut him out. <laughs> you can't brush over it. It's all sticky. Uh, oh. So Gloomhaven, I played one session and I thought this is a good game, and we haven't played any more sessions since, and I'm unhappy about that. I'm unhappy about that as well because I spent a lot of money on that copy of Gloomhaven and it's hardly been played. I've been trying really hard to get you guys to play that game again and every time I do, someone screws it up. You mean Alora because she hates it. <laughs> yeah, she's Alora's one of the opponents. Yeah. I think Alora's played it like four times now as well. She has, yeah. She plays it at least to you and you two, yeah. Bless her, she's really tried, but, uh, I mean, she's wrong, but um, she just doesn't like the sort of hacky, slashy... It's one of the reasons she doesn't like RPGs, because mo- she sees most of it as basically being on combat, so she finds it dull. She should join one of so- our RPG sessions. <laughs> yeah, 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 there's no combat. It's all massacre. <laughs> to be fair to her, I think she's probably mostly right about Groomhaven. Um, it is just walk into room... And murder things in, in weird ways. Yeah, in, in tactical ways, yes. Mm. So, yeah, I think John's gets on to the point. Because we hardly seem to get a chance to play the physical version, I think it'd be quite cool to play the digital version. Yes. Definitely. And hopefully the digital version will be slightly cheaper than the cardboard version as well. Can you play it multiplayer? I don't know. They haven't released much details about it. So far, all they've done is like a little video, like a little teaser mm. video. Now... I've heard it's not a direct translation of the board game. So it's going to be like an interpretation of the board game. So hopefully they haven't changed too much. Yeah, I wouldn't about that, how they're, how they're going to manage the um, the card deck bit of it, which is obviously the, the driving force and the USP yeah. behind Gloomhaven. I don't really know how they're going to digitise that and not make the game turn-based. Because it looks real time. I don't know if it is, but 
because otherwise, if you're just digitising it and making it turn-based, just let's play the cardboard version. But you also see as well that um, it, it hasn't had as much of a fanfare, but you see they're doing a digital-only Mansions of Madness game. <gasps> I'd not seen that. So it's not... I only found this out because once I found out the Gloomhaven was coming, I went to the Steam page and added it to my wish list so I could remember. And it said, you know, at the bottom it says, games also by Asmodee Digital. I was like, ooh, let's have a look at these. And in there was uh, Scythe coming out, digital version of Scythe. I knew that, yeah. yeah. Digital version of Terraforming Mars, and then this Mansions of Madness. And I just thought, hang on, that, that's just the, that's the app, isn't it? And I thought... No, it's not. That looks different to the app. Ooh. And it isn't. It is a standalone Mansion of Madness video game. Ooh. So old. So, yes, uh, in a few months' time, we will not be doing a board gaming podcast, but <laughs> a video gaming <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Because we can never find time to play games with each other. That's true. I am interested in the Gen 7 thing. John, John, John and I have looked at this, and it looks kind of cool. Yeah. Because I'm a bit of a fan of Dead of Winter, because it's evil and mean, and it's a crossroad game, which is the, I suppose, the USP of Dead of Winter. And Gen 7 contains a similar mechanic. So the idea is of the crossroad bit is you get a... Uh, Ideally, particularly difficult choice, although to be fair, in Dead of Winter, some of the crossroad choices are not that hard. It's like ride horse into town looking like John Wayne or murder it for food. Usually it ends up ends up murdering it and feeding people. Bindus lasagnas all round. Exactly. <laughs> Tesco go value value beef. Maybe the designers <laughs> are vegetarians. <laughs> Although you you still got Sparky the Wonder Dog with assault rifle and a guitar, so you know <laughs> that does sound like quite a wondrous dog. <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. I have not played that game in ages. Well, you played it at a board game night a couple of weeks ago, because um, Paul and I are big fans of it. So uh, whenever I turn up with it, he's like, "Yes, we're playing that." Did anyone commit suicide? No, we didn't have uh, we didn't have mental Santa, so no one could do that. Sadly, <laughs> but for the second game running, Simon was the betrayer. So next time, I'm just gonna f- shoot him. I'll just just have done with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I don't care. Bang out. You've been exiled. How did they know it was me? Yes. <laughs> um, but this is kind of almost like Crossroads. Dev, de, dead of aliens or something like that because it's kind of set in the future ish it's um you're on like a like an interstellar spaceship looking for like a new planet to hmm. colonize so it sounds like it's the journey on the spaceship between you and where it can get to and as we've seen by numerous sci-fi programs what could possibly go wrong no yeah. no it'll be fine <laughs> hello have you ever noticed though all of these spaceships in these films always look like sh- look like shit places to live. Why don't why don't they throw a f- carpet down or something and put the lights on? <laughs> Carpets, well, it weighs a bit of mass, and you've got to accelerate that up and decelerate it down. It costs more fuel. Company's not going to pay for that. Lighting again costs fuel. Shut up. Have you not seen the? Um, <laughs> is it passengers? <laughs> Yes. Is it Passengers? Passenger. Yeah, with Chris Pratt and... Um, yeah, someone else. An attractive lady. An attractive lady that I can't remember the name of. Yeah. That's really bad, isn't it? But you can remember Chris Pratt's name. Hmm. He is an attractive man. He is an attractive man, isn't he? You can't deny that. That's true. He's probably another PHC three for three, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> We would all turn gay for Chris Pratt. Absolutely no problem at all. <laughs> I forgot what my point was now. Something about passenger and power saving. Yeah, the ship on that looks like um, some like space age mall. Yes. Yeah, you know, it looks it looks like Trafford Center when it just opened. Trafford Center. God, I remember that. Oh. Do you remember how luxurious that was when it first opened? Yeah. How how futuristic and awesome it looked. And then you go there now, it's just like, oh yeah, it's just another shopping centre. <laughs> it center looks now. like <laughs> strange ways just up the road. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> Good Have we never been to either? <laughs> we don't know whether this is the shopping centre style of spaceship or the loose collection of pipes of a gantry running through the type of spaceship, but obviously bad things will happen. And the crossroad cards will no doubt tell us what they are. So I think, yeah, we're all interested in this one as well. Yeah, sounds really good. Yes, very much so. 
It looks interesting. Although, I have to admit, the layout of the game doesn't look as I expected it to. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I don't know really what I was expecting, but... Yeah, I was looking at that. It, it looks like it's going to be a different game mm. to Dead of Winter. It's not just like Dead of Winter rethemed. It sounds like they've just taken the crossroad aspect mm. and then ported that into a completely different game. Which is good. Yeah. They're not just rehashing a game, but... I'm not really sure what I was expecting. Maybe, like, a big board and a spaceship, but that would probably make it more, more, more like Lemesis or that alien game that we didn't get to play at Expo that I can never remember the name of. You're going to have to be more specific. That alien game. The one that you really <laughs> liked. The, um, like Nemesis, but not but not Nemesis. Ah, uh, this is ringing a bell now. Yeah, there you uh, go. There you see, you see. Name is, Nemesis is like aliens, whereas this one is more like alien... Yes. And life form. Life, life form. form. That that's it. the one. Yeah. You're thinking of Tristan. Tristan. Tristan that's Hall. in. Yes. Yes. I am Tristan. I I agree with you though that Gen Seven. I was expecting a board. Mm. Yeah. That's what. But I kind of like if it's it. if it's a narrative uh, driven game, then maybe not having the board allows you to do more and different mm. scenarios. Agreed. And it becomes a little bit. You know, it takes some of the aspects of what can be good about D and D, in that. It's a lot of it's in your imagination. So if you're describing the scenarios, you've got more variation with less uh, less expensive cardboard. Win. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm. And of course, having lots of cards means the game's a lot more flexible, so easier to set up, etc., etc., etc. So yes, definitely. Mm. So it sounds intriguing. I think it does indeed. Colour me intrigued. So that's the end of our Gen Con hotness. I would say. Those are the yes. bits that stuck yes. out to Steve that Andy and I then looked through and agreed with. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I think I've broken that fourth wall again. <laughs> Crashed it with a brick. Oops. <laughs> let's um, let's move swiftly on. To be fair, we have been otherwise engaged. Yes, there have been holidays, that's true. There have been. And we did play some board games on those holidays. We did. I've heard a rumour as well. Yes. It's, it's a filthy <laughs> rumour rumor. and it's not true. It is true. Andy played Talisman. Yeah. And he loved it. Right, quick, cut the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you much for listening. Good night. No, I've been John, no, he's no, been no, Steve, no, he's no. been Andy. Bye. <laughs> whoa, 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 sweet child of mine. <laughs> sweet Christmas. <laughs> let's, let's put the brakes on there, boys. I, I think this, so, needs, this, this needs to carry a... A very large swollen asterisk. <laughs> so we did play Talisman. Andy played Talisman. He was a priest. Uh, we uh, played it yes. for about three hours. There mm. were... And everyone, had, everyone had about one turn in that time. That's not true. There were a number of new players, which made it possibly not the fastest uh, game of Talisman. That is an understatement. Well, Talisman's never a fast game. It's more about the journey. <laughs> hmm. I think Glacier move quicker. I saw you smile. When you smile. say new players, were they new players completely to board games? Because it's not as if there's a lot of difficult concepts in Talisman. You roll a dice, you move left or right that much. You pick a card up, you decide to beat the crap out of something, you roll some more dice, decide you've lost, you... Yes, take some hit points, you pass to the left, that's it. It's not fucking yes. difficult, people. Some people in the game uh, like to read and fully understand <laughs> the entirety of the card. If I say the words, actually, I do have one little question, you'll probably be able to guess who it was, Steve. <laughs> it's fine, I'm oh, sure Ben doesn't listen to this podcast. Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> He's just very meticulous in his uh, reading and understanding of the cards, that's all. <laughs> he is, and there's nothing wrong with that in that. It's just the problem is he also picked up an artefact that allowed him to pick up three cards at once. No, so no. It just exacerbated the issue. <laughs> he picked up two <laughs> followers, <laughs> and each one added one more card, and then an option <sighs> to add one more card, depending on which card you picked up as the extra one in the first one, which um, someone who can be a little bit indecisive slowed things down somewhat <laughs> it didn't help that after three hours we're not playing eclipse with ben no <laughs> no it didn't help that after three hours uh we had to put the board away because uh we had to make dinner and so we just cut it and we didn't so no one got turned into a toad fundamental good bit of talisman uh no one actually died fundamental hilarious bit of talisman <laughs> yeah 
it was missing a few of the the iconic moments, but I think you probably got the gist of it at least, Andy. And I now certainly you can, did. Yes. Now you can legitimately slag it off to your heart's content. Right then, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it wasn't as bad as I was expecting to be. Cut the card past. <laughs> That's it. But right. that is about as Games positive. Workshop, that's the box quote from the next version. It was, yeah. PHC quote of the century. Yeah. It wasn't as bad as I expected it to be. Even Andy says it wasn't as bad as I was expecting but, to, to be it fair, to be. my standards, my, my expectations are pretty <laughs> low. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The scary thing is, I have played worse games. I, you laughed a couple of times. I saw you enjoying it from time to time. Um, I wouldn't get that far. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you were picking stuff up, and you were going, "Ooh, that's quite cool. I like this bit." Yeah, but I never got to <laughs> use it because I the dice <laughs> to me every time. <laughs> and that is the one thing I hate about it. It was just. Absolutely no, no planning in the game, and I've got all of this stuff. You're right, and I've got. I found it really frustrating. I mean, the downtime on it was just crippling. Um, you're right. As I say, that was unusual for that game that it was quite so much downtime. It was. I, I, I just know. It, it, it broke one of the fundamental issues of, of games for me that I had no personally had no. I didn't have much. Um, what's the word? Not import, but agency. agency. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, in what I was doing. So one thing you can do to improve that is Play house else? rule. No, well, yes, but <laughs> you can house rule uh, in the game. If you roll a dice, that's how many spaces you move, and your only choices are: do you go right or do you go left? You could house rule it to say that you can do up to that number of spaces. A labyrinth rule, basically. Yeah, yeah. but. But it's still, you're probably going to go and encounter the space, which means you pick up off the same one deck. <laughs> That's true, actually, yeah. It suffers betrayal of house on the hill syndrome. No matter which way mm-hmm. you go, you're still picking up the same tile, sticking up the same tile, sticking it down, rolling some dice, getting the shit kicked out of you, you know, passing to blow and moving on. And, uh, and I sold betrayal of house on the hill because I thought it was the biggest pile of shit I've ever encountered. Did you ever play Relic, Andy? Obviously, obviously you didn't, because no. if you have not played Talisman, you've played that Relic, haven't you, John? Yeah. So Relic was uh, Fantasy Flight Games' uh, 40, Warhammer 40,000 reskin of Talisman. Yeah. Oh. And Ugh. it's a much better game because they had this new setting. Rather than just put a skin over the top of it, they actually redesigned the game. Mm-hmm. So one of the things they did is they put regions into the board, which gives you different decks. Oh, okay. That's cool. So, the, so basically you've got Elder region, Chaos region, Orc region, Tyranid region. And so each of those decks is themed for that region and you needed a roughly you needed a particular skill. So rather than having the two skills of strength and magic, I can't remember the Iron Talisman, um, it gave craft. you multiple skills. Craft, sorry, skill and craft. You're good at making good beer. <laughs> <laughs> Relic gave you different skills that were all colour-coded as well, so you could easily spot them. And it also did also gave you a couple of things to alleviate the dice like it gave you these cards you could use which are like these fake cards where you could either use the special ability or use the card as that number mm. so it would have a number it would have a dice face on it and you'd use that dice face instead of rolling the dice so it's like i desperately need to move to that spot to finish what my mission plunk i'll use the two cards which mean me two spaces kind of thing so i think relic is a much better game but it's still tells me it does still suffer from one of the same irritations though like i remember playing relic once and spending about a dozen turns just trying to land on this one space so that I could progress. Mm. And I didn't. And someone else won because I just physically could not get to that one space. I, I was like massively overpowered compared to all the other characters in the game. I just couldn't roll the right number to get onto the, the place. Again, house rule mm. yeah. sorted. Mm, yeah, that was the one of the issues I had because as the priest, I'd um, I'd got a talisman. I could get through the get through the. the Get through the pit Portal of fire, of whatever that was called. That's the one. That staircase and all that sort of shit. But my priest wasn't really powerful enough to get through the bloody door in the first place. And um, and also, had I got through the door, I'd have probably got the crap kicked out of me quite readily. Yeah. It was just a simple case of, had we played on? Because this just got to the, pay, the point where after three hours, this is roughly where we were. Which was, now my priest had to just walk around the board getting better... 
And that to me just did not fill me with delight because it was just essentially just trundling out and I was completely at the mercy of We need of to play it again sometime. One, just once more. We don't. But, <laughs> but with people who've played it before. Because I think you'd have a different experience. <sighs> it would be better. I'm not saying it would be, it'd be brilliant, but it would be better. It'll yeah. be faster. <laughs> the pain would be over quicker, but I think the, the fundamental issue would, would go away. That's the problem. Because there's, just, there's, there's always a planning that you can do on somebody else's turn. Like in a worker placement or pretty much any other game, somebody else is having their go. You can be thinking about what, what you want to do on your turn. Then you do your turn and somebody else goes and there's less downtime. It is much more reactive, you're that, right. That's the issue, which I, I cannot physically plan what I want to do till my die till my die's been rolled. At which point, you know, if you've got a lot of stuff going on, like Ben did or a couple of people did, or, you know, you've played it a lot, you've got a lot of cards to play. It meant that is inherently a lot of downtime, and just thinking of you know what you have to do on your turn rather than as you go along, which is frustrating. I think it makes a difference when you, if you stop thinking about it as a euro, whatever, uh, and accept that you can't plan masses ahead, and it's more being part of a story. I don't mind that so much. I mean, Mansions of Madness mm -hmm. is is like that. I don't mind any of that. That's not much of an issue. I do like the story aspect of it. It's it's the fact that for five out of six, you know, five six of the game, I could have been sat reading the paper or something, or it would have made no difference. I have no involvement, no yeah. agency in the game That's fair. until it's my go, and that to me is very boring. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. You did it. So it's it's finally happened. He's finally played it. Yeah. Yes. It's taken 46 podcasts <laughs> to get this far. So, yeah. <laughs> so I can expect that we might play a proper game of Talisman at around about episode 92. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe for the 100th edition we can do a live game of Talisman. Epic. Oh, dear gods. <laughs> to be honest, not even I would want to listen or... to that. <laughs> oh, no. Followed by Twilight Imperium 3. Again, <laughs> pretty sure I wouldn't want to listen to that. <laughs> Do you know what? I reckon you could finish TI3 quicker than you could finish Expanding Okay, Talisman. so for the 100th episode, There's a we will play TI3 <laughs> and Talisman simultaneously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Oh, In the meantime, <laughs> what else are we up to? <laughs> it's going to take us that long to learn the rules of TI3, though. In the meantime, we should escape from that topic... Oh dear. Oh Don't dear. roll your eyes and put your hands in your heads. No, hang on. <laughs> heads in your hands. Andy, you went to... Uh... I'm lowering my glasses, Mr. Case, to look over them at you. Ah, Steve's got his impressed <laughs> face on again. You look like you look like librarian from school. <laughs> Every time I went in there, what are you doing here, Lewis? You can't read. What are you up to, Lewis? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at porn, sir. <laughs> You're in the wrong library, Mr. Lewis. No, I, I can show you where I, I can show you. If you go to this back shelf here, <laughs> oh shit, I'm not supposed to show you that. Um, yes, Mr. Cage is right. I um, recently went to escape room and uh, escaped, obviously, well from here. And <laughs> just lock you in like the crystal maze. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it was quite straightforward. It was actually a, a friend of a friend of Laura's who's now a friend of mine, and it was their birthday. Um, so they organised this escape room in Birmingham, just not very far away. And um, the idea is you get locked in a scenario, and obviously you obviously have to escape. And the kind of clues in the name: you get an hour, and you get you get told you get chucked in there. We did a kind of a samurai based one, so the room everything in the room was sort of Japanese and decked out. It looked like a Japanese um, house, but a pagoda, something like that. And uh, the idea was of our game. I won't tell you too much about it because in case anyone does go along. Um, but the story is that uh, you are trying to sneak into the palace as an assassin, and you get caught which is obviously you get locked up and you have an hour to escape before the person you're trying to assassinate comes back, finds you and you know, murders you himself. So you have an hour of real time to figure out how to get out of the room you're locked in and obviously ultimately escape 
uh, the um, I'm going to say trap essentially, but a sort of scenario um, because it's not it was because ours just wasn't just one room. So you escape one room, you need to get into another room. There's a bunch of puzzles. It was almost like do you remember like I mean you've sarcastically mentioned the crystal maze there, John, but it wasn't a bit. It was a bit like that because. I could definitely tell some of the puzzles were not automated because the girl that uh, was introduced to us was basically watching us on camera I was trying to offer some clues. Would you like a clue? F no, we're going to solve this ourselves. <laughs> You've Piss been here four literally. days. Take the clue. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go home um, and see my family. <laughs> <laughs> my children are starving. <laughs> Some of the puzzles were very much uh, manual, so like you put these things in a, in the correct order, and then all of a sudden, you know, you hit, the door opens or something like that. It's clearly the girl in the room pressing a button because you can see it on camera or something like that. But you don't really feel that when you're playing it. You kind of just realise afterwards. Hang on. Um, but it was really good fun. We really enjoyed it, and it's obviously a team game. There were five of us on the team, and there was there was actually eleven of us in the in the whole group. So we did two of these things simultaneously, one team against the other. One, one did you win? Six. And he, our team won by 49 seconds. <laughs> and how long did it actually take you? Three days. 4.49 minutes, something like that. All right, so it's bloody close then. I do about 12 minutes left. No, no, I mean, it was close that. between the two teams. That's incredible, really. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I agree. It takes yeah, you close, almost yeah. an hour to finish it, and you finished within the same... Roughly the same minute. 49, 14, not 59. I said almost an hour. To finish it. So at the ballpark okay. of an hour, you finish <laughs> within a minute of one another. Hmm. And that's quite impressive. Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Um, we really enjoyed it. It was really good fun. I strongly recommend it. And I would like to try the other one, which they have, which I can't remember what it is, but apparently it's a bit more thinky. This was a bit more dewy. Physical challenge. The other one's a mental challenge. But much, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost, you know. The, the other one might be a mental. This was this was more this was more of a mystery actually. Uh, but you get cryptic clues all the way through it, and you know, we, there's a cryptic cards and diagrams that you have to do this, and um, there are various characters that we had to organise different objects around and make sure things are in the right order. And there's a few dexterity things we have to do as well. So it was a nice mix of of different skills. So. Uh, a few little sort of sliding puzzles and all that sort of jazz. So it's, it was good fun. While you were doing it, did uh, did the lady on the camera was she like uh, just playing into a harmonica every so often and talking about her mum? <laughs> <laughs> talking about mumsy. No, funnily enough, no. Um, it was great. It was great fun. So if you if you like that sort of thing, um, even if you don't, if you don't, you should still go along. I'd give it a go. But they're all of the country. There's different ones, um, and I think they change obviously because you know once you can't have the same one uh, forever. But we did see the the, the, the the all these professional teams that go round um, and the ones in the country, and they finish them in like in ludicrously quick time. Forty nine like seconds, twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 49. <laughs> Well, I'm like, God, how the hell did they do it? How did they do it this quick? Oh, it's oh this God. puddle <laughs> repeated. I'll just do those things, those things. I've done it. We're out. Probably. I suspect there's probably some similarities between a lot of the puzzles. But uh, no, it was good fun. We really enjoyed it. So we talked a bit about Talisman. We talked about some escape rooms. Steve, what games have you been playing? I've played quite a few games. Have you indeed? Mainly because I visited a board game cafe. Oh, <laughs> make it sound like a, a novel experience as a board game. It was gamer. a novel experience. To visit a board game cafe was a novel experience. I live in the middle of bloody nowhere. Oh, so that's true. That's your own fault, isn't it? <laughs> All you've got is cafes. I'm, I'm not you posh, you suburbanites who live near escape rooms and board game cafes. This is a novelty for me. <laughs> they live near an escape room. Are there any board game cafes in Malvern? Not that I know of, but you do have an escape room about a 300 yards from your house. Do we? Yeah, there's one on um, the Marvel Industrial Estate where the uh, ice rink used to be. Near that dodgy... Uh, the, the, I've, got, I've got to explain this. Near to that curry place. Oh, Asher. Yeah, the Asher. curry takeaway. Asher, yeah. Asher Dyer the curry. The only curry 
restaurant on an industrial estate that I've ever seen. It looks it's pretty amazing. Much. It looks like a knocking shop. It's actually quite a good takeaway. <laughs> it's practically uh, a porter cabin, basically. It is, yeah. <laughs> yes. It is very and good. And the curries have got a lot of food colouring in, because I remember buying like a chicken tikka once, and I'm not kidding, I think you could see that thing from space when I <laughs> took the foil off the top of it. <laughs> it came out pl- plutonium orange. <laughs> yes! Isn't that the same place that no matter which curry you get, the curry sauces all taste suspiciously similar. No, that's Spice Cottage. Oh, sorry. Mm. <laughs> that, that's Spice Cottage in Melbourne, where me and Amanda ordered two completely different curries on a takeaway, got them home, opened them and went, hang on, these are both exactly the same. <laughs> this one's got... No, they must taste different. <laughs> no, nope. nope, they are exactly the same curry. This one's got prawns in, that one's got chicken in, and that is the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What they've got, they're just two jars of Uncle Ben's and just pour it into in prawns and chicken. Heated it up, job done. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to get my waffle stick out again. Steve, you went to a board game cafe. <laughs> yes, so I went to Draft in London, which is actually the first board game cafe I'd ever even heard of, to be fair. Mm. So this is under the arches in one of the railway, over overground railway. So you get that whole thing of every... Ten minutes, the entire place shakes and rumbles. Awesome. While the train Does goes it rattle the board components enough to get them off the board, or like? No, it's not that bad. It's, it's to be <laughs> fair, it doesn't shake your table that much. It's just this Ambience. rumble overhead. So, yeah. <laughs> Wait, wasn't that counter over that <laughs> son of a? <laughs> it was the trains. <laughs> Why have all my resources got on the floor? <laughs> We've now got to the point where our body clock is screwed because we both get up to get to work early in the morning. So I went to see my sister in London and we woke up at like 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Everyone else is asleep. That's because it's normal. What the f- wrong with you? No, I yeah, wake up at 7 o'clock every day. We um, we turned up at drafts basically at the point when they turned the open to close sign. I'm like, hello, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, how long have you been waiting here? <laughs> We basically had this place to ourselves for the first hour, but by the time we left, I think we we were there between 10 and 1, and by 1 o'clock, that place was absolutely rammed. There wasn't actually many tables left. So the principle of draft, I don't know if it's the same as other board game cafes, is you go in, you pay for your table, which was uh, £5 per person for four hours, and then you have a board game library, which you can help yourself to, and they've got table service of food and drinks. That's pretty good. Um, what is Sounds really cool good. as well is that there's a fairly extensive library as well and they had people there which could teach you the game and or recommend games so we, we ignored them and just went straight in for it <laughs> you know um what was really cool and this was a really this is a minor thing but this is one of the coolest things i think i've seen in a while the tables had like a shelf just below the table okay it's like another table surface about four inches lower than the actual table mm-hmm which is just enough space to fit the board game box in. Oh, that's Good cool. Idea. So set up, set up the game, put everything you don't need back in the box, slide the box into this little shelf. It was really cool. Oh, that's good. It sounds, actually, because actually, I was similar, same weekend, I was up in um, Scotland. I was in Air. That was the weekend yes. after. Same weekend. I think it was yeah. the same weekend. Because I was hoping yeah. to get to Air, to get to um, Board Game Cafe in Air. But which I forget the name of now, but um, it was closed because their website was, was wrong. Rubbish. And they said they opened at 11 o'clock on a Sunday and they didn't open until 12. So we were we had to catch a ferry. So by the time we'd have got in there, we'd have had to have gone, well, this is nice. Bye! But, um, it sounds like Noughts and Coffees and Games Hub in Edinburgh, which I did go to mm. last year. See what they've done there. Yes. Do any of them name their board game cafes after actual, like, good games? Or are they all just, like, noughts and crosses, drafts, chess? Well, the um, the first one, which I think was in Canada, wasn't it, is Snakes and Lattes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See amazing. what they've done. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, don't get quite... me wrong. I, f- I, of all people, appreciate the puns. But you just think, like, <laughs> could you... I guess maybe they're appealing to more, the more mainstream... It, it's it's that whole thing of trying to get people who may not know, you know, Settlers of Catan or you know, Blood Rage or Arkham Horror into a shop, really, yeah, isn't it? Indeed, you know? Yeah, and the one in Air call is called Unboxed, so it's a little mm. more closer to the uh, to what we're used to. 
Norse and Coffees is a bit like that. So it's proper cafes with table service, um, and there's a selection of board games there. So that's where I played um, Terraforming Mars for the first time, mm. and mm, okay. uh, was was a little underwhelmed. Controversial statement. I was quite impressed with it. We played uh, Dream Home because it was me and Amanda, so I tried to pick some games that were new to me because they were there and weren't too complicated. So we played Dream Home and we played Whistle Stop. Mm. I have played neither of those games. Both of which I rather enjoyed, actually. So Dream Home was like a card drafting game. So you had a series of uh, cards would go out and it's like blueprints. So what you were trying, you, would, you had like a, your board was a house. And you were trying to put rooms into it. And there were certain rules, like you had to build something on the ground floor before you put something on the first floor. And things like um, you could put living rooms next to each other to make bigger living rooms. So what you were trying to do is try and get these cards to make the biggest scoring rooms you could. Mm-hmm. And then there was um, other cards which allow you to do like special effect cards kind of thing. But you had to always take them in a pair. Right. You always had to do to take like one off the top row and one off the bottom row. And in a two-player game, it meant whoever went first also got to remove one of those options. Really simple game, actually, because what you're really trying to do is just trying to get these little combinations, like, can I get three living room cards into the place in once? Can I get both of the garage cards in? You know, you just, like, score optimising. Really quite simple. Quite enjoyed it. Not quite sure. I'd, I'd play it again, but not quite sure I'd buy it. Because mm. I don't know if there was enough game in there for me to worth buying oh, it. Oh, okay. Whistle Stop was a more interesting. Whistle Stop was a like hex board which you laid out as you played, and all these little trains and train lines. And the number of trains you had was dependent on how many players were in the game. So more players, less trains each, kind of thing. Makes sense, yeah. And you would each hexagon had these like little routes on them, and what you were doing was moving your trains forward on these little routes, and you were trying to pick up resources, so different coloured cubes try and drop off at certain cities and it was a beautiful looking game and it played really nicely as well i've heard of good things about it actually i've not played it myself mm. yeah i've heard of it whistle stops seem to be seem to be getting pretty good reviews i, I said only two players only me and amanda played and i'd like to play it with more players because i think with like three or four players it's going to get busy and what people play is going to either hinder you or help you kind of thing mm-hmm. because we could have split off and basically like treated the top half of the board as one and bottom half of the board as another. But it means that if someone does make a really economic route, everyone else can funnel in after them kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be careful you don't make something that's too good, otherwise everyone can direct their trains that way. Right. But re- really quite simple. I mean, it looked complicated at first, but it's really quite simple to play because you can only go advance as well. It's, you, you could spend coal to move... And whistles to go backwards on the board, but whistles were really rare. Okay. So you would you you advance in the game as you're playing and building up this little train network, and always the option of a dick move. Mm. Excellent. By blocking your opponents or trying to put roots and, and a bit like Suro. In a way, it's like Suro with resource collection. Okay. Okay. It sounds a little bit like Ticket to Ride. Uh no, that you're building I would roots. say I would say more like Sora. If you can imagine the, the way that you put something down yep. and you move along that route, so everything think moves of it like it. that. Well, no, no, they can, you people can move along that route after you've placed it down, right, okay. if that makes sense. Um, but some of those routes might lead to resources you need to drop off to get you the big points. I'm with you. So a little bit of a, a little bit of an element of that. Yep, I really enjoyed it. As for my view of drafts, I was really quite impressed, and I think I would like to visit there again. To be fair. Mm. I've often liked the idea of opening a board game cafe. I thought that'd be cool. I just need to try and work out a pun on drinks that works with talisman. I've been trying to think about it for the last three or four minutes. I've got nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that one. <laughs> Why don't you make it slightly unique and make a board game pub? Yes. You'll have to laminate all the uh, the player boards, though. <laughs> we don't know the Game of Thrones incident. Or just accept that they're fodder. <laughs> mm. It's uh, a business expense. <laughs> but the bloody expensive, ex- expensive one. You wouldn't yeah, want to buy any Kickstarter exclusive ones, would you? Despite well, the though. shelf stuff. Yep. Mm. Or maybe you'd have like a trusted thing. You you put down a deposit if you screw up the game. <laughs> I think that's how some or some other board game cafes do it. Actually, you pay a deposit rather than um, like what we did, which is just pay to hire the table. Well, you put your credit card yeah. behind the bar. <laughs> 
So one game I have played this very recently via the medium of Tabletop Simulator. Not Interpretive Dance. No, no that's different. Although Interpretive Dance might have been more effective than Tabletop Simulator. Oh, well, oh, dear. yes. Tabletop Simulator crashed every 15 minutes when I used it last, which was nice. Great. <sighs> oh, good lord. Yeah. Anyway, this is a game called Hero Master, the game of epic fails. Which, if you went to your Games Expo, you might have seen this uh, on show then. And it is coming to Kickstarter September, I believe. And I've been asked specifically by the designer not to compare this game to Munchkin. Right. And so the first thing I'm going to say is, this game's a lot like Munchkin. No! Yeah. Right, I'm out. See you later. No! Be- bear with- ah, no, no, no. Sounds bear good. with me. Hear me out. Hear me out, Andy and dear listener. Because... Like Munchkin in that it is a game where you are a group of fantasy tropes, bumbling idiots going into dungeons and killing monsters, and all the cards are quite humorous with silly names and little jokes on them. Right. An epic game of epic fails is a humorous card game of dysfunctional engineering. Sorry, dungeoneering. <laughs> <laughs> On the surface, it is Munchkin, because that's basically the same theme as Munchkin. And it's got the same kind of thing. It's got silly jokes in it. It's got silly power abilities. And it revolves mainly around trying to dick over your mates. I like it. I'll buy three. Yes. John, this is a game you'll like. What makes it a bit better, though, is the Munchkin, which let's all agree (laughs) is terrible. No, no, it's not terrible. It's like Talisman. It has its place in the world. Carry on. No, not in the bin or on fire. Carry on, Steve. So Hero Master is you will choose uh, the monster you're going to attack and whoever is the first player gets that choice. And in your hand, you have attack cards and fumble cards. So attack cards are you have to play to commit to attacking this monster. And then fumble cards are cards you play on other players. And the whole concept is that you are like the B team of adventurers. <laughs> you're the kind of like get, you're the ones who get picked last to go on epic quests. So just like our D and D sessions, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're the kind of people that the the rest of the heroes don't actually want to come on adventures with them. Like the example is the the priest spends far too much time trying to convert everyone to their religion. And the halfling eats all the food rations of all the other players, that kind of thing. Right, I see. So these fumbles you can play on other players are all themed in that way. Right. And what you basically do is you go and take it in turns choosing what card you're going to play. And you have to play an attack card to be in the round, which is the interesting thing. From then on, you can either play more attack cards up to three, or you can play fumbles on other players, or you can pass. And of course, once you've passed, you can't play any more cards. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's okay. So what this results in is this really clever tactical bluffing game. Because you can't go in on the attack. And by the way, as well, you keep this hand of cards for the entire round of... Uh, the entire like dungeon you're doing. So you could have to fight up to three monsters, or I think you could actually up to fight up to four monsters with only like seven cards in your hand. Yeah. So you're playing cards to try and make sure you've got a nice strong attack, make sure you've moved the first player marker to you so you're the first player to attack while avoiding the other player's fumbles. All right. So there's a little bit of careful card play and careful bluffing. Like What I found worked quite well is try and open with a weak attack so that your opponent would fumble that and then hope you could last around until he's decided to pass, and then you can play a really strong attack on that second or third attack and hope that he doesn't beat the monster on his first or second attack. I can see the smirk on John's face, and I think John is really going to love this <laughs> game. I've got uh, six words for you. <laughs> Jamie Noble Fryer, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds awesome. At the same time, I can see the complete look of distaste and disgust from Andy. And I think it's a little bit undeserved because there are some clever things in this game. But I also think it's probably not a game you're going to like that much, Andy. No, it doesn't sound like it my sort of thing, no. You could play it, Andy, and then you can compare it to Talisman. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Shall I compare thee to a Talisman? To, some, to, 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 to a Talisman day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Twenty-eight I think that's, hour that's the very last day. thing that either of those needs. One of them is going to cop a serious kicking. 
in fact they might both do I'd give this game uh, five talismans. That is, it is five times better than talisman. <laughs> no, yeah, but five times zero is still zero, John. Oh, I think you agreed earlier that it wasn't zero. <laughs> no. Some small fraction, no, it possibly. Wasn't, wasn't, it was, it was, what, that was the term they used in mathematics? Tend towards zero. That's right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Approaching infinity. Hmm. It's like a tan, a tan function. Never quite gets to zero, but you know, let's be realist. It's not far off. Well, each to their own. However, this game sounds awesome. But to be fair, it was better than Magmeda Monsters. That is a reference that, like most people listening to this podcast, are not good to no, get. No, they won't. No, because that game died, died hard. I died Gando twenty four hours after I published a review of it. Or is Talisman still going strong? Uh, must be a really Talisman. good game. <laughs> there is a, an interesting cause and effect on that one because if you looked at the uh, kick trap graph for Magmeda Monsters, it was doing okay, and it was the same day Andy published the review, it lost like 10 backers. <laughs> it was like green, 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 red. <laughs> it dropped oh from about 49%. In, in about seven days. We did quite well to start with, but then, yeah, after the review came out shortly afterwards, the campaign was cancelled. Those two events may or may not be related. Well, it's nice to know that we're listened to. I refuse to believe I've had that much effect on the industry, but uh, it's kind of cool if I have. <laughs> There's a smug sense of satisfaction in a way. For the record, it wasn't a bad review for sensationalism. It's just how we felt about the game. Indeed, yeah. Yes, it was a bad game. I even offered some constructive criticism, but uh, it fell on deaf ears, unfortunately, so... Oh, well, never mind. Better luck next time. But no, it doesn't sound like my sort of game, Steve, this, this munchkin the second. Admittedly, I didn't think you would like it, but I was actually rather impressed with it, because I actually went... <laughs> I must admit, I ignored it a little bit at the expo because oh. I saw it and kind of went, okay, oh, this looks a lot like Munchkin. Mm. This is why you shouldn't go to the expo without your John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I actually think this comes back to our expo coverage podcast, but um, I think John would have been more happy at expo than either of, than either of us. <laughs> You're mm. the third person there again, Andy. <laughs> mm. I know what I meant. <laughs> but only because most of the games there were quite light and uh, for light children. And, yeah, definitely you can say not it. Sort of, well, no, that's, well, not what I meant, but you know, you put words in my mouth, and I'm not going to take them out. <laughs> <laughs> that's the rule that I never mind. <laughs> but um, there are only literally about two games there that were the sort of things that I would be instantly t- drawn to. Obviously, one of them was Twatty Hadouken, but. Um, a lot of the games there were simple card games or variations on that theme, which were certainly much more, much more up your disease ridden alley than mine. How dare you? <laughs> Ridden's a bit strong. <laughs> Potted? Yeah, that's more like it. <laughs> anyway, sorry, sidetrack there. Again. I'm trying to get back to review about Hero Master, and I realise there's not actually much more I can talk about because it's not a massively complex game and it's not a massively deep game, but I actually quite enjoyed it. Mm. Well, there you go, guys. It, 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 it did what it needed to do. And, you know, um, Sounds like fun to me. Comparing it, comparing it to Munchkin, yes, it's going to have, have lots of people comparing it and think it's a similar style of game, which style-wise it is. But the actual mechanics are really, really different. And do you remember Epic Death, John? I loved that game. So Epic Death is, funnily enough, the designer of Hero Master is a British-based UK games artist, Mm -hmm. and the designer of Epic Death was a UK-based game artist as well. I think this is more involved than Epic Death. Okay. Because Epic Death was all about pushing your luck, wasn't it? It was all about like basically taking a bet and then yep. rolling quite literally a bucket full of dice. But it did have <laughs> a similar mechanic in that you were hedging your bets to begin with based on the game yeah. flips halfway through. You go from trying to win all the battles to trying to make sure that you die in the most heroic, epic way possible. <laughs> <laughs> this is us the game. 
A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Although Zanhorn, for the record, doesn't want to die. <laughs> he wants to live through it all <laughs> and then sing songs about it. <laughs> right. I would say, though, again, that's a very similar theme because that was the same gist, wasn't it? You're a bunch of heroes going to dungeons and killing monsters mm-hmm. and with silly, with silly art. Hero Master <laughs> is more tactical again. What are you going to say? Silly bang, then? <laughs> Bang, and the monsters are gone. <laughs> I think you've been drinking silly bang. Are you sure I'd beer in that class? I don't know. It is fizzing oddly. Know. It's just because you said silly. What? Maybe it's just crappy Skype audio, but it sounded, it sounded more like silly than silly. <laughs> bang, and this board game shit. <laughs> there you go. Hero Master, on the other hand, sounds good. Take my money. So I think that's where we should call it a day, don't you, chaps? Or a night. I'd say that yeah. would do... For one evening or a night yes thank you very much for listening we have been polyhedron collider oh don't forget to ooh, actually ooh. before we go i have to <gasps> mention oh uh i have pulled my finger out i have <sighs> bought an expensive computer <laughs> and um i have taken to some video editing with the help of camtasia studio and we do now have all of our well, all of the D&D sessions that we stream to Twitch are now also available on YouTube. So if you go to our YouTube channel, Ooh. you should find them all there, neatly arranged in two separate lovely uh, playlists, ready for your audio and visual delight. Slash boredom. Slash. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I will say is that the earlier sessions in particular, the first one to two episodes, the sound quality isn't the greatest it's certainly not up to our podcast standards and that was it turns out because my laptop doesn't like the heat and doesn't cope well with it and so although i've bought a very expensive computer that now loves it you know you could do you could do five streams at once (laughs) Uh, i could have just put some fans on my laptop and it probably would have been all right so uh... (laughs) that's low cost solution (laughs) yep why spend, why spend 20 quid when you can spend yeah, 2,000? Yeah, uh, On the other hand, that. I can now play some really nice games in 4K resolution. And 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 this is yes. more important for you, dear listeners slash watchers. Uh, I can now transcode the videos from Twitch to YouTube in a matter of about an hour and get it uploaded. Wow. Ooh. So, That's, that's a bit nice. So, yeah. I will recommend you must play Elite Dangerous then if you I want agree. to play a super duper computer. <laughs> it's very good. In 3D and in VR as well. Oh, that'll be that'll probably make you hurl, but I know you get a bit affected I, yes, by VR. Yes, I've got VR, PlayStation VR and that works great unless I play one of the 3D look around shootery kind of things. So I've actually got Eve Valkyrie and uh Mm. I can last for about 20 minutes then. before I have to take the, the headset off because I'm physically sweating and I need to go and find a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> you, you definitely shouldn't play well, Elite is, Dangerous. That was Elite really Dangerous, basically. Eve Valkyrie, very similar. So, uh, okay. yes, so D&D, oh, well. um, yes. this Thursday, half past seven, British Standard Time, we will once again be... Uh, Summer, summertime, John. Summertime. Yeah, that's what I said. Which is summertime. Standard, standard, time. standard British time <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> you heard. <laughs> anyway. So, yes, we're on Twitch. T- what is it? It's twitch.tv slash polyhedron collider. And the videos are on, poly- on youtube.com slash polyhedron collider. Yeah, there's a couple of um, playlists there. One if you want to listen to all of them, and a couple of separate ones if you just want to listen to the two. Campaign. They're not really separate campaigns because they're kind of linked. Kind of linked, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, two separate but interlinked campaigns. Let's call it that. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I should have said that that link is youtube.com slash user slash polyhedron collider. Take you to the right one. Right, if you search for YouTube polyhedron collider, you'll find us. Yeah. Let's be fair. No one types the actual address in these days, do they? Ridiculous. <laughs> If you'd like to chat us on Twitter, we as a group are Polyhedron C. I am Wahoffle Madenga. <laughs> it's a ridiculous name. It really is. Mm. We need a, we need a good word with him, John. Chop it down. I am at Sonic H with a zero. And I'm John underscore Cage. 
We are also on Facebook at Polyhedron Collider and the Board Game Geek Guild 2726. But for now, happy gaming, and we'll see you again soon. Indeed. Tra! Catch you later. <laughs>